Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Chris Brown. I'm the Vice Provost for Faculty Development, a professor in Geography and Atmospheric Science and the Atmospheric and the Environmental Studies program. And it's my pleasure to uh, have this great opportunity to welcome you and introduce Alice Bean for her inaugural lecture as University Distinguished Professor. So. At a, at a research university that, that we're in, most of us are familiar with embracing the unknown. But of course, Alice takes the unknown into things in this universe that we can't even see uh, with our own eyes. And she labels this as an adventure. So um, I'm very excited about this adventure. Um, Alice is an internationally regarded researcher in experimental physics, and today she's going to share with us uh, a lot about uh, her life and work. Over her 27-year career at KU, she's worked to explore our universe and expand our understanding of how it functions. She's an expert in detector technology and was a principal developer of tracking detectors made with silicon for the CMS experiment, the D0 experiment at Fermi National Accelerator Lab near Chicago, and the Clio particle detector experiment in New York. I assume we're going to learn some, something about that. She studied a diverse range of physics analysis topics involving particles decaying into heavy quarks, as well as the heavy quarks decays themselves, and she's currently a member and has a leadership role in the CMS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, and is a co-discoverer of the Higgs boson. Can you all hear me all right? Can you hear me now? Hello? All right, I'm going to have to shout then. She's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Physical Society. In 2010, she was elected to the Executive Committee of the Particle and Field Division of the APS. In 2016, she was elected to the Executive Board of the Forum on Outreach and Engaging the Public for the APS. And she also won the very prestigious National Academy of Sciences Jefferson Science Fellowship and spent a year working as a science advisor for the U.S. Department of State. She was also featured on the 2010 2011 KU Women of Distinction calendar and was inducted into the KU Women's Hall of Fame in 2019. So for most of us, this would be a stellar career, but this is only part of Alice's story. She's been passionate about sharing her interests with others, especially children. She's promoted science literacy through her Huffington Post blog. Her Huffington Post blog. She's also mentored over 80 undergraduate researchers and was recognized by the School of Engineering with their Gould Award for undergraduate education. And at KU, as you look at your magnets that we handed out, she's created the project called Corked, Adventures in the Subatomic Universe Project, which promotes science enrichment activities to elementary age school children. She continues to engage over 100,000 people a year through its website. She's provided hands-on moderated programs to several thousand school children in Kansas for which she's been honored with the Steeples Award for service to Kansan. We are excited to have Alice here joining us tonight for her inaugural lecture. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Now, did they tell you to do something with the mic? Uh, I'll just talk in the mic. Can you hear me? Yeah, we're not. Can okay. we get some help with the mic? Yeah. Testing, testing, no, testing. Yeah. yeah, they turned it off. But he, it's not coming in your thing? No. He, he can hear it. Okay, I'll, I'll speak loud. So shout. I'm used and we'll to shouting. Okay. Sorry about no, that. No, I'm used to shouting, so that's no problem. Uh, so thank you for coming, and thanks for the introduction. And. Um, Today we're going to start by, I am going to uh, show you a video, and that's by way of introduction, and we are going to, uh, and then once you see the video, I'm not going to talk about it for a while. You see before you a device of incredible power, an amazing machine that will let you visit places that are too small for the eye to see, take you on adventures that are smaller than small, tinier than tiny, and so teeny weeny. What's going on? 
What's Going On is an adventure so charming yet so strange, you'll find out what's up and down and top to bottom. With Quark TV, follow three friends as they explore the subatomic universe, which is smaller than molecules, littler than atoms, way smaller than any bit. Isn't it cool? Travel along as the smart and daring Mushi, the unknowing and clueless Danny. Quarks, is that a rock group? And the skeptical but lovable Harold. <laughs> Go on the adventure of a lifetime and discover what they and everything else are made of. Step inside the Proton Subatomic Universe vehicle for an accelerated adventure and a super fast ride that will change the quarks and the world around them forever. <laughs> Beware, for there are challenges you must face, forces you cannot escape, and bullies you must decay with. Huh? What? Oh, yeah. Did I mention Derek was coming along? So, turn that dial, adjust your size, and start thinking miniature as you travel to the smallest known places in the universe and get yourself quarked. Okay, we made this uh, video a while ago, and I'll tell you more about that later. But Can we have someone just really quickly try? Okay. So uh, I'll I'll be talking loud here. So I mean, if you like step closer. To um, it, okay. Really Is this better for folks? Yeah. Is this better for folks? Yeah. <laughs> it was up before, so yeah, I'm whatever. Not sure. Yeah. But okay. Do well. You have, do you have? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, do you have more videos to play? No. No. Oh, okay. But the videos are fine because I can turn the thing up on that. It's yeah. this mic. It's this just the the, microphone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll talk loud. So uh, that is our cork video, and you have refrigerator magnets, and we'll talk about that some more. But first, I want to tell you about my adventures in um, particle physics. And I feel like I've had an adventure my whole life, but I'm going to hit on three themes. One is to embrace the adventure, keeping it real. But to keep it real, you have to work hard, you have to collaborate, and you have to communicate. And then the third part is to figure out how you take data. And then the main thing you have to do is figure out how to throw away a bunch of data. So um, that's what I've spent my life trying to figure out how to do. So I'm going to start early. And maybe you can tell why I'm going to start early because uh, we're going to talk about this later. But I grew up in Flagstaff, Arizona. In Flagstaff, Arizona, there's lots of snow. And uh, here you can see my older sister, Susan, who I'm happy to have with me here. And this is me and our dog. Uh, so I'm happy Susie came. And um, it's cold in Flagstaff sometimes, but um, it's also our house was two miles from Lowell Observatory where they discovered Pluto. And we went up there a whole bunch. It was always cold in the observatory. And I did an elementary school project where my parents got me up in the middle of the night. And we went out and looked. And there was beautiful stars. And I, I ended up winning a science fair on that in my elementary school years on all these photos. But I really hated getting up in the middle of the night and going out where it's dark and taking pictures. So astronomy was not for me. <laughs> okay, now my sister, uh, here she is with my mom and me. My sister is totally into geology. Since we lived in northern Arizona, it's a good place to be uh, interested in geology. My dad uh, was a chemistry professor at northern Arizona University. And my mom was a, a high school math teacher. And so I was really privileged and had lots of opportunities when I was growing up. 
And they took us around and my sister would always annoy us by we'd have to take pictures of, of rocks and <laughs> spend a lot of time. So geology was not for me. And then you get to junior high and this is right next to our junior high. And um, the biology folks make you memorize all this crap instead of going around the pond and having fun. And then we had to dissect frogs and all that. Too messy, not fun. Biology is not for me, or med school. <laughs> now my dad was the lab director at, at the university, and he always wore a white lab coat and was always telling us all about the safety issues. So chemistry was not for me, it was a little too scary. So I didn't know anything about anything else except for I knew that I sucked at English because I had to be subjected to Beowulf a couple of times, both in high school and in college. And my English teachers can tell you I never got it, OK? So I'm not that smart. So I was good at math. So I thought, well, OK, I want to do science. Let's do physics, OK? So I uh, went to school at University of California, Irvine, and I majored in physics. Now, my dad was on the school board, and he didn't like the high school physics teacher, so I never had high school physics. Um, so I just started, and I majored in physics. And um, um, once I got there, I decided to also major in computer science, because why not? Anyway, I worked with the physicist programming computer games. I learned a bunch of uh, classical mechanics, and I still didn't understand what physics was. It was OK. Uh, we had fun. We worked with computers. This was the Terra computer. That may be me programming it. Not sure. And uh, the computer science had to work with punch cards. But I graduated, and I thought, OK, still don't know what physics is. I want to be Dr. Bean. <laughs> I mean, literally, this is how you make your decisions. Dr. Bean sounds like it's a fun idea. So I went to study in, ph in physics at Carnegie Mellon for grad school. And um, part of why I did physics as opposed to computer science is because I've always thought of the computer as just a tool that you use. And I got to use a lot of tools because physicists use computers a lot. Um, so this is Carnegie Mellon, it's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I did my PhD in five years. The first two years I was at, uh, in Pittsburgh, and when I first got there, I thought I wanted to do experimental solid state physics, okay? That's what I thought I wanted to do, and the first day I was there, uh, I met this guy, this is Bob Kramer, and he was a particle physicist, and he said, well, you want to come and talk to me about particle physics? I go up to his office, and he starts saying, we're working on this experiment at Hamburg called the crystal ball experiment. We're studying J psi decays to E plus E minus. And I was like, whoa, whoa. I knew nothing about particle physics, and I thought, he said, so are you interested? And I said, no, OK? He later ended up being my PhD advisor, OK? <laughs> So I'm sitting there after my first year in grad school, and you're taking all the classes, and you, you have to be a graduate teaching. Uh, I was a teaching assistant helping a hapless undergrads. Try, we were both trying to figure out how to use the oscilloscopes. But um, then I'm like, well, I need a research job for the summer, so I have to find somebody who's going to pay me for the summer. So all the solid state experimentalists didn't know what their funding was. but. I thought, well, I'll go back and talk to Kramer again and ask him about particle physics. So I go back to Kramer after the end of my first year, and I say, can I work with you? And he says, sure. So you're going to work on this thing called the axion, and if we discover it, we're going to get a Nobel Prize. And I thought, cool, I am in. This is fun. This is what I want to do. Well, so that summer, I worked at, in Pittsburgh. I had to keep maintaining. I, I still don't remember what I did, but every day I had to do something with that Vax computer there. That's all I remember. And um, here was the experiment. It was in Hamburg, Germany, but I was at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And I was like, OK, this is cool. And then the next fall, I had to take classes. I also decided to learn uh, German because I thought I was going to be going to Hamburg to work on this experiment. Well, it turned out that year that they decided to join as a new member this other experiment. 
So I was the first person to be sent to the Cleo experiment from Carnegie Mellon. So I went there on my own as a grad student, and that's in Ithaca, New York. That's where Cornell is, and there's a big accelerator there, and there's this experiment called Cleo. And like I say, I didn't know any particle physics before this time, so I was learning particle physics. Well, one of the interesting things was I got sent to this uh, Cornell professor, Gill, and um, he was kind of grouchy, and I was talking to him, and he says, okay, you need to help us make this drift chamber with this electronics on it. And he seemed like he was really in a hurry, and he said, we sort of need this, I'll talk to you next week. He said, oh, by the way, this guy Chris Bevick, he's really busy, he's an electronics genius, but I'm not sure you should bother him. I was like, whoa, okay. So I went back and I had no idea what I was doing. I was trying to figure it out and I thought, well, we better figure this out. He seems to think I can make this thing work. So I, I read some stuff and then all of a sudden, I'm like, well, I talked to the other grad students and they're going, no, that Chris Bebick, he's really mean. I don't think I'd go talk to him. And I'm like, yeah, but he seems to be the only one that knows how to make this thing work. So I finally got my nerve up and I go to Chris. I said, could you help me with this thing? He was totally nice, okay? We got this thing running, and I went back in the week or two weeks or whatever it was to the Cornell professor. He says, how's it going? I said, we got it working. And he was completely freaked out because he didn't think I would get anything done. But I assumed since he thought I could do it, I could do it. So I figured out how to do it because he needed to get it done. And so this is what you did. I didn't know what I was doing, but I figured out what to do. And this is how we work in particle physics. You learn what you need to, you find somebody who can help you. So we had a lot of fun. I actually got to work the accelerator. <laughs> I turn it on, you could hear all the klystrons going. And um, we had various things like here's our detector, here's the innards of our detector, which is a tracking chamber. I wasn't working on that, but they got all the grad students uh, overnight. We had to help cable this because it has all these cables in it. So they would give us shifts at night. And so we'd work from midnight to whatever with these postdocs. And the post stocks would give us pizza and it was light and so it was not quite as bad as the astronomy in the dark cold <laughs> okay so we had fun we also had to babysit the detector because when we run for data we actually run 24 hours a day and so we're taking data all the time so you have grad students you get to meet all kinds of interesting people while you sit up at night and try and stay awake <laughs> monitoring the detector so I had a great time and one of the things that happened is then I went back to Carnegie Mellon for the last five months and this was 1986 and we'd been using email for a couple of years now and I went back and my advisor Kramer says there's this email thing can you help me figure out how to use it and I'm like yeah it's pretty easy I'll help you out I thought it was amusing that I had to help my advisor with these with these stupid little tools that I'd been using for several years. So we did that and then I graduated. So this was uh, my thesis, okay? <laughs> you guys all got that? <laughs> I felt really like I knew everything. Well, I did on that thing. I, I knew that topic, and I know some of you know this topic. But I felt all proud of myself because I knew everything about everything by this time. And I went home at some point during this time, and I flew back. And you have to fly to Phoenix, Arizona, and then there's a two and a half hour drive up to Flagstaff. And my parents came and picked me up at the Phoenix airport. And we start driving home, and mom says, so what are you doing on your PhD? Can you explain that to me? And let's just say all of us should have to explain to our mom what we are doing. <laughs> 
We spent two hours, and I realized that it was actually kind of hard to explain to my mom what I was doing, because it's hard to explain particle physics. And that was kind of frustrating, but that sort of left, you know, here I am, I think this is really cool, I'm having a great time, but the general public really has no idea what I'm talking about. And my mom's pretty bright, so she kept hammering at me. My dad finally took uh, pity on us and declared a truce, and you know, and we finished that conversation, but that left me with the whole idea, well, okay, you gotta learn to talk about what you're doing. So I um, got my PhD, and then we're gonna zoom through some stuff. So every, I, I went, uh, so I was working on my PhD at Cornell, and then I moved to uh, UC Santa Barbara, and UC Santa Barbara was great. I was living in Santa Barbara, but we were working on this experiment called Fermilab E691. Fermilab is a, a laboratory near Chicago, Illinois, and this experiment actually had run before I got there. It had taken all of its data before I got there, but it was really kind of groundbreaking because it had this new detector made of silicon to do tracking, and it also took a whole bunch of data. It took truckloads of tapes, and this was unheard of back in 1987. There were people driving with tapes all the time and taking those tapes away. So I actually um, wasn't stationed at Fermilab, but I went there. It was actually kind of fun. I was there in 1988 when Leon Letterman won the Nobel Prize, so we had a big party, and I was like, cool, I'm working with Nobel Prize. You know, this is kind of fun. He wasn't on our experiment, but we all celebrated. And um, so I worked on that experiment by analyzing data for the next five years. And we had wonderful data. It was great data. Um, but the whole time I was there, I was building the next experiment. So the next experiment, so I was making the experiment that I was going to run in the future. So the SLD experiment was at Stanford. And you can see it's a large experiment. And we start climbing on things and doing all kinds of fun stuff. So it starts ramping up. We have 150 people on that. And then I went back to Clio. So I was doing all of these three sort of at the same time. But then I came to KU in 1993. And once I came to KU, I was working on Clio again. And by now, it had 200 people on it. And we had a better detector, one a detector I had actually worked on earlier. We were using to take data at that point. And then uh, I joined my friend uh, here, Phil Beringer, we joined the D0 experiment at Fermilab. Now, he actually joined earlier than me, but I joined in 1999. And by this time, the experiment has 600 people. And you can see all these flags. I'm sitting somewhere down there. Here's our detector. And um, here, I got to be on shift with people from Russia, from Brazil. Uh, it was, we had a great time uh, babysitting the detector, making new detectors. And that ran till 2008 or so. But before that, we got asked to join the CMS experiment, which is the experiment I'm on now. So CMS, I've been on since 2003. It, it stands for Compact Neon Solenoid, but that's neither here nor there. CMS, you can call it. So I, uh, CMS is a detector that's located in an accelerator at CERN. CERN is near Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, our experiment, there's more experiments than us, but our experiment has people from 50 countries, over 50 countries on it. And um, when we publish a paper, there's um, 2,500 authors on it, OK? All of us are on the paper. And this is me in my hard hat in front of this detector. And that was what the picture was at the beginning. It's a giant detector. And this is really fun because uh, you get to go to Switzerland you get to eat chocolate, and you get to have a fun time, and you get to meet all these people. You get to play with Italians, Russians, Iranians. We don't say that too loud. All sorts of people. Um, so everyone's on this experiment, and we're having a great time. So um, this is where I am now, but let me just step and tell you that 
LIDAR DETECTORS DO IS THEY'RE LIKE CAMERAS. SO THEY TAKE AN ELECTRONIC PICTURE OF PARTICLE COLLISIONS. SO WE SMASH TOGETHER PARTICLES AND THEN WE SEE WHAT COMES OUT AND WE TAKE AN ELECTRONIC PICTURE AND THEN IN ORDER TO GET THIS DISPLAY YOU HAVE TO RECONSTRUCT THINGS OFFLINE. SO IT'S NOT LIKE THIS IS COMING OUT AS YOU'RE TAKING IT BUT WE CAN RECONSTRUCT IT. SO THIS IS AN EARLY PICTURE OF CLEO AND YOU SEE WE HAD THESE BLACK AND WHITES AND WE WENT ALONG. BY THE TIME WE GOT to D0, we got in color. And you can see more particles here, um, but that's because it is from protons. And here you can see an event picture from our current CMS detector. So, we, so what we're doing is we're trying to take all these pictures. So I'm sitting here talking about particle physics. I'm having the time of my life. This is the neatest thing. We're working with all of these people from all over the world. It's great. It also costs a lot of money, and it's hard to talk to the public about it. And I'm like, well, why is it so hard to talk to the public? After all, everyone knows the planets, and everyone can talk about astronomy. Why can't we talk about quarks when we're a young kid? Because quarks are pretty interesting. So I, um, you know, along the way here, I go and I visit my cousin uh, in Montana, and she has a five-year-old daughter. Okay, five-year-old daughter. Her name's Megan, and Megan. I go into her room, and it has all these planets. It has these stars. I'm like, why do the kids <laughs> astronomy? Why? Why? Anyway, I'm talking to Megan. She has a book on planets. Okay. And I say, Megan, what's your favorite planet? And she says, I don't know. I haven't been to them all yet. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, well, there you go. So I'm like, if we can teach kids about particles and they can get excited about particles, then we can do a lot of stuff. Well, um, I started on this adventure and decided to make characters of all the particles. And um, the design department at KU, Dick Varney, was very important to this. And he actually is responsible for a lot of the visuals. And um, Andrea Herstowski uh, did the web design. And we got this whole group. Uh, but one of the key people was Teresa McDonald here uh, from um, the, the KU Natural History Museum because she knows how to communicate with kids. They have all these shows over there. And so we started trying to find funding for this, and I got a big slap in the face because the education experts say that kids should not learn about things that they can't see. Of course, you can't see the planets. <laughs> And you can't, and so, okay, the education experts also say, no, you should wait till physics is in, in high school because kids are not developmentally able to understand things. Piaget tells you this. And I was just angry. I was really angry, okay? Megan knew all about planets. She's five years old. So I started uh, deciding, well, let's see if we can help this. We were able to talk, Chris and Bowman James helped us to get some funding, and we were able to create this project. And then Teresa and I uh, actually did a bunch of studies, and kids as young as four and five can understand plenty of what they don't see. There is no problem with kids understanding things, and we have to just enable kids to do things that we don't know because they'll figure it out. So that's how we started Quarked. And so now, let me describe a little of these particles. I sort of know more about them now than I used to. So um, the smallest things we know are, are quarks. And in the theory, they're supposed to be point particles. They're tiny. And they're what make up our protons and our neutrons. And the lightest ones here, the up and the down quarks, are what we're all made of. And then it turns out that you can create some heavier ones, like a strange quark is heavier and then a charm quark, and a bottom quark's even heavier. Um, so these guys have like one electric charge and these guys have another. So they all have different properties. And so that's why I think of them as, as characters, okay? Uh, so they have names and stuff like that. Well, in the uh, 1980s, this is what the quarks look like. And, uh, 
1995, the top cork was discovered. It's way heavier than everything else. And, and so that was fantastic. I got to see that discovery happen. I wasn't on the experiment when they discovered it. But um, that was fun. And then what I do is, if, it's easy in hindsight to say what you specialize in, but I look at this bottom cork. And why do I like this bottom cork? Well, it's a heavier cork, and it has lots of interesting things that decay to it, things that are predicted that might decay to the bottom cork. But the bottom corks also have a lifetime, which means that if you create them, they live for a while, and then they decay to other stuff. So this makes them very interesting to study. So we're going to talk more about the bottom cork. So what are we doing in particle physics? Well, if we could see it all the time, we wouldn't need to run these accelerators all day, all night, trying to get all these pictures to understand things. So we are always looking for something rare, OK? Because if it's not rare, we've already seen it. So uh, sometimes this is most of the time, rare is less than one in a trillion, OK? So if you have a couple of pieces of sand in an Olympic-sized swimming pool, that's what we're talking about, uh, rare. So we have to figure out how to take over a trillion pictures, OK? Way over a trillion pictures. And we have to figure out, once we take them, how we're going to see things. So we need a huge amount of data. And we need a camera or a detector to capture the data. And then we need a way to sort through the data. So, what do, um, so if we look, one of the favorite things, this was fun. In 2012, we actually discovered um, something really rare, the Higgs boson. And uh, this Higgs boson, I'm not going to tell you all about it. That's theorists can tell you about it. But it, it's actually pretty important. And it may be responsible for a lot of things that produce mass. So uh, once we discovered the Higgs boson, here it is. <laughs> you can buy one of these at the Natural History Museum if you want to go get one for your kids. Uh, that we have them. Anyway, I only make characters of particles that we've discovered, OK? There's no supersymmetry particles that we made or anything else. Maybe soon, but not today. So, uh, but this was cool because I actually was involved in the thing that got the Nobel Prize. So this was something that we discovered that was fun. OK, but the Higgs is one thing, but um, we have other things that we can do, OK? And so it turns out that you can't embed something on this particular computer. So we're going to play it on another computer. So um, I'm going to play what a display looks like. So this is a giant detector. And you collide particles. And then you get this big burst of stuff. Okay, So this is an animation of what happens in our CMS detector. So that's the kind of thing that we're looking at. Now, that's a giant detector. And let's go back and see how we look at these things. So, so what do we do? We start out with these protons. Okay, So a proton is, we call it the proton subatomic universe vehicle, the proton SUV, because it has in there, it has all these quarks in there. Okay, And so what we do is we get this giant accelerator. It's several, <laughs> it's 20-some uh, miles in circumference uh, under the ground in Geneva, Swi near Geneva, Switzerland. And we collide these uh, protons together. It's not just one proton. We collide, there's a bunch of protons. Protons, but we're going to simplify it and show you what happens here. So these protons, by the way, before I tell you that, the proton subatomic universe vehicle is from her kid, OK? Yeah. We made a deal that I would take care of, uh, that she would help take care of my dog while I was away, and I would take her kids occasionally and do stuff. Well, Anthony, uh, their younger kid, is the one that first drew the SUV and decided uh, another kid. They understand this stuff fine. There's no problem with them understanding. Uh, her other kid is the motivation for eat your peas when he found a green pea in his um, his his 
enchilada. So you should watch that video. Uh, evidently, boys don't like green stuff. So anyway, so you take these protons and you smash them together. Okay, so they collide. And you're able to create uh, new particles with the energy if you collide them together fast enough. So if we zoom way in, and I mean way in, you zoom way in, and you can see that maybe we created all these particles. So let's zoom in some more. So I've given you a actually a really rare event. It has a Higgs boson in it and a, this W here, but that's not so rare. And all these other quarks. So then what happens? We're still zoomed way in. So this Higgs boson, it's really heavy. It decays immediately, and it can decay to B quarks. So let's say this Higgs decays to B quarks. It does that right there. And the W may decay because it's heavy. And it may be decayed to an electron and a neutrino. Now let's zoom out. So then what happens right there is all these particles start uh, flying out, okay? There's this huge explosion and these particles start flying out. Well, so these bees start flying out, but all of these guys actually are already, they just start um, decaying into tracks. And if we zoom out, the collision happened here. But these B quarks, because they have a lifetime, actually traveled some distance. They didn't travel very far, 0.3 millimeters. And um, then they decay. So these B quarks, if we can figure out a way to measure that distance, then we can tell whether they were B quarks, because they don't point back to this primary vertex. They have these other place where they are. So that's what we've tried to do. So we make these particle, um, these tracking detectors and we'll go back to the quarked we'll go back to the quarked uh, page and let's play some games you can play these games undergraduates make these games high school kids actually program these games it's easy so um, well they learn how to do it I, I don't know how to do all of it but the kids have no problem figuring out how to do this so um, let's say you have this magnetic field and since these particles have charges some have positive charges some have negative charges when they fly in this magnetic field while they don't have tracers on them they actually make these curved paths because this magnetic field is there. And so maybe the positive particles are, are going up and the negative particles are going down. And the ones that have more energy or more momentum are going straighter than the other ones. So by actually trying to figure out their paths, we can measure their momentum. Okay, And we can tell whether they're positive or negative and measure their momentum. So if we could just figure out how to make all the particles carry these little light bulbs like this, this would work. But that's not what happens, okay? It's not like those tracks are left in there. So we have to actually put in detectors. So if you put in the detectors, so let's put some silicon in there and we put some silicon layers in there and now what happens when we shoot out these particles is they leave an amount of charge on the detectors where they went. So if we can figure out where that charge is, then what we have to do is we have to, um, we have to uh, figure out how to connect the dots. So uh, let's see if I can play this as I stand here. I'm finding the highest momentum positron. Let's see if I did it right. Yay! I got it right. You guys can play and learn how to track particles too. Uh, so that's what we do is offline we actually uh, do a connect the dots thing and we have software that, that then uh, does all of that stuff. So that's how we make our tracking detectors. So now on CMS, Presently, we have a detector that has 100 million pixels. So 100 million, we are able to measure these positions 100 million different places. And this is, uh, that, uh, this is part of that tracker. Here's some uh, silicons uh, there. And um, here at KU, we actually tested uh, over 300 of these, uh, these sensors. And here's some of the crowd that tested them. And here you can see now an event display. Now, 
here, this is for our heavy ion folks, this is not a proton collision, but um, they can tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe there's thousands of tracks here that we've had to reconstruct. So this is what we do now, okay, is our detector can do that. So, okay, we discovered the Higgs in 2012. What are we looking for? Well, there's plenty of theorists out there, and there's a hundred different theories every day. There's always something to look for. So um, we're trying to understand a whole bunch of stuff, and so we're still searching for rare things. So we have to take more data. Now, your camera maybe takes 60 pictures a second, but our camera has to take 40 million pictures a second. And um, we're building a detector that's going to be have two billion pixels. And so we're taking, well, um, we're down this year, but we're gonna be taking data with the one we have in for a few more years, but then we're gonna install this new detector with two billion pixels. And so part of our problem is that you have to take those pictures, okay? So that's part of the problem is to take the pictures, but then you have to get the data off of the detector, okay? So what do we do? We throw away part of the data. We already throw away, we only keep about one to 2% of the data. And then there's something else that's only recording about 75, 100 events per second. So we don't quite have to record 40 million pictures a second. But we need to get this inf interesting information out of the detector. So let's think about this. So your iPhone, if you have a really fancy one, can take 60 pictures a second and maybe you got 12 megapixels. So in our, in our camera, we are going to have to get 3,000 gigabits per second off. So CMS compared to your iPhone is like taking 4,000 pictures a second and trying to transport them off your iPhone. I uh, hope you can use your wireless on that. Is that gonna work? It's kinda hard, okay? So our problem is how do we get the pictures out of the detector? How do we get that information out? So I alluded to stuff before. We have all these cables, okay? So here's our CMS detector, and this is the, tr the larger tracker going in when it was in. Here's people, so you can see how big these detectors are. And here are the cables coming out of this detector. Our pixel detector that we have in there right now, here are a bunch of the cables coming out. So this is the 100 million uh, pixel camera, and here is the detectors we built and the cables coming out of that. So uh, there's the sexy stuff, which is the, the detectors themselves and all of the uh, electronics chips. But then, like everything you've ever built, what are the problems? plumbing and power, okay? And these cables, while you may not think they're the sexiest thing that around, they're actually one of the more difficult things to make work. So at KU, we are designing, building, and testing how to make very small mass, because what do we want? Do we want these, hey, here's some big cables. You got room for that to get out of your detector? No, okay? So if you look at all of these cables that you might have on your computer, they have an inner conductor and they have shielding um, because all of you guys are talking on the cell phone all the time. And so that's a problem, is how do you shield against all of this other stuff? So we have to get the information from this detector here out to this optical conversion thing where we have a laser and we can shoot it off on optical fibers 60 meters off the detector. So uh, we actually have these little tiny cables. They're uh, micro twisted pair cables. This is a Swiss franc. Now, Chris, my colleague, said I should have had a picture of a Swiss franc next to a quarter so that you can tell they're the same size. Um, but we work at CERN, so we have Swiss money. Anyway, so these are tiny cables, and um, they, we have them up to 1.4 meters long, and they're trying to carry these really small signals. And what we're trying to do is send them really fast, and then they go to an optical, uh, an optical uh, transceiver that ships them off the detector at 10 gigabits per second. So what we're trying to read them out, we have to speed up everything so that we can read at one gigabit per second, or 1.2 gigabits per second. 
And that's pretty hard. A uh, USB cable, USB 3, is about that speed. But once again, it's a very big, bulky thing. And that's one cable. OK. We have to get all of these out. We've got to make 10,000 of these okay, uh, and to get out of the detector. So we have to make sure that we're not losing the signals. And so the test equipment for this is actually uh, pretty uh, interesting. Um, this thing here is like your computer, but it's programmable so that it can go real time. It's called a field programmable gate array. And um, programming that in, a, in, a, in what's called firmware is actually a, a really interesting skill that you can get lots more money than being a physicist doing. Uh, but all of our students uh, learn how to program this thing so that we can output these signals across this 1.4 meter long wire at over one gigabit per second. So that's what we're doing. We're making all of those cables to get the information out. So that's the hardware. Now we get some of the information off the detector. Now what do you do? Okay, so let's look at, this is 2013 from Wired Magazine. These are the sizes in the world of data sets. So at that time, the whole Large Hadron Collider, which includes all of, the uh, all of our experiments, was putting out 15.3 petabytes every year. And you can see that's about 1% of the total world use of computing. So our field actually does a lot with computing. We have computers all over the world. We are slowing down your internet. And I'm sorry, we don't care, because the internet was created at CERN. So, so uh, it's OK. If we slow down your internet, it's our internet too. Anyway, we have all of this data, and you can actually look. This is the CERN tape room, which has uh, storage for uh, 200 petabytes of data. So that's a whole bunch of data. So that was 2013. If you look now, there's 2.7 zettabytes. I had to look up what zettabyte was. 10 to the 21 bytes of data. And um, you know, there's 3.8 million Google searches a minute, 450,000 tweets per minute, which is much more than the tweets in 2012. So if you just look at our detector, our detector is taking data at 50 terabytes a second. So that's a lot of data. And we're recording 10 exabytes a year, which is a little less than 1% or it, it, it's a, a, a substantial fraction of the world's data. Okay, so this is the challenge. And we've been doing this for a long time. And so we have to figure out how to throw away a bunch of this stuff because how do you look at that much data? So we uh, have been using for a while machine learning techniques such as neural networks. And um, the neural networks are getting more sophisticated. What do neural networks do? They take tons of different information and they look at the correlations and try and see if you can find the correlation in between this data. And um, so a lot of people call this artificial intelligence. <laughs> But computers are actually really dumb. I've known that for many years. They're only as smart as the people um, programming it. So as physicists, we're doing a lot of this programming. And I can tell you, some of us have problems. So uh, you got to watch out on this uh, software. But one of the things we have to do is we, we're throwing all these artificial intelligence things at it. We've got to understand what we're programming. <laughs> And that's the challenge now, is there's a lot of people who will take all this information now and, and just throw it in this black box of this machine learning tool and something will pop out. But we actually have to control it a little more and understand what we're doing. So um, you know, there's a whole bunch of new techniques here. And it's a brave new world. It's always changing. It's changed over the 50 years or however long I've been in this. So what do I do? I don't know how to do it, so I find some young, smart people. 
and um, they're going to help us figure out what we're doing. So I want to show you our, here's our, uh, our small research group right here. Eh, Sadia wasn't there uh, for the picture that day, but here you can see some of us sitting at KU. And um, earlier, we have a bigger research group. Uh, it's on the CMS experiment. We have over 50 researchers at KU that work at CERN. And this is our group who work at this experiment. And at one point, we had five postdoctoral researchers at CERN sitting, living in Switzerland. So anyway, I want to thank you for coming. And that was what I wanted to tell you. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. We have time for questions before we have our reception. Yeah. Alice, thank you for a lovely talk. Uh, your excitement regarding science is so clear and so well communicated. You make a big point of collaboration. I can, you can only imagine how challenging that is. One definition of collaboration involves sharing resources, uh, responsibilities, and rewards. Which aspects of collaboration are the most challenging for you, and, and how do you overcome them? Okay. Well, um, part of the collaboration is the Europeans pay for half of this stuff and U.S. pays for half of this stuff. <coughs> These are expensive detectors. Uh, uh, the CMS was $500 million. So you can't do it unless you collaborate. So the money aspect, trying to convince people in the US that even though this experiment is happening in Switzerland, it is actually uh, a bunch of US people are doing it. And hey, we discovered the Higgs boson, which was the Nobel Prize. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, as I said, um, all of our collaborators, and there's about 4,000 people on it. Of those, about 2,500 are physicists who are authors on the paper. So my name goes on all of the papers. And um, the process of uh, everyone gets to read the paper and comment. And that is not fun. <laughs> so by the time our paper goes to try and be published in a referee journal, we've had to deal with uh, various collaborators. So um, I don't know. Uh, maybe that's one of the more difficult things. But um, it's actually kind of fun because we all get our own little things. <laughs> OK. It's not like you're lost in this. Uh, you know all the different people. So that's fun. Yeah. Alice, what's, what's the latest? What are we looking for? Oh, what's the latest? What you, what's the latest thing you found? Um, so uh, one of the things that we're doing, uh, one of these crazy theory things that's been around for a long time, it's called supersymmetry. And we haven't found it yet. And that's actually a bugging a whole bunch of people. So what we've been doing the last few years is narrowing down that this stuff that these theorists think is beautiful might not be here, but it's really hard. It's like whack-a-mole, where you hit it somewhere here, and then they say, well, look here. OK, and, and then you whack the mole there. Um, so a lot of what we've been doing since 2012 is actually finding out, yeah, this probably is what we call the standard model Higgs boson. Uh, we've measured a whole bunch of properties of this Higgs boson, and um, that's helped us understand a whole bunch of things. But all these new particles that all the theorists think have to be there because the mass of the Higgs is at an awkward spot. So they think that the theory has to be, that there has to be something that we can see. Uh, what we've been doing is looking under every corner, uh, under all over the place, and we're narrowing down things to say it's not here. Okay, but, but right now our group is, um, my colleague Chris Rogan has convinced us to look for this crazy thing called supersymmetry. And so well, that's what we're looking for now. Yeah. Me? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Monica. Um, how do you know how peer review works on papers with 500 <laughs> yeah, OK. So she's asking how peer review works on a paper with 500. Uh, well, it's actually uh, about 2,500 authors. And uh, we've had joint papers with the other experiments. So I've, I've been on papers with 5,000 authors. OK. Uh, so what? What happens is it has to get out of our collaboration first. So our peer review 
starts in our collaboration with groups. It goes through about four layers of peer review before it even gets out of our collaboration, where it goes to a, a reviewer, probably from our competing experiment. And um, they'll, they'll also, by that time, sometimes they come back with a few things. But by the time it actually gets out of our collaboration, uh, it's normally you, you feel it's going to be published. Okay, but it goes the normal peer review process when it, you go to a journal. Are you suggesting you forgot what a rejection letter looks like? <laughs> um, I, what happens is we get these things back saying, why should we publish your paper? And we still get that, okay. And we had to answer a whole bunch of things. But you have, uh, you have a whole bunch of people who that's all they do is figure out how to talk to these editors and, and they smooth the language of you're likely to say something nasty and they have people who will smooth that out in our collaboration. So. Yeah. What advice would you give to younger people moving up trying to move into this field? So, um, like I said, like I, I just think you should go do something fun, okay? If you don't think it's fun, then don't do it, okay? Astronomy, no fun. <laughs> Biology, no fun. But this is fun, okay? So why would I, my advice is uh, work hard, go find people to help you. Um, so if you want to know particle physics, yeah, you can read a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, it, it's probably not good these days to come and not know particle physics. If I were to come to grad school now, not know particle physics, I might get barbecued a little more. Um, but you, uh, learning this stuff is good. But the main thing is that you just got to be willing to try things. Okay, so in our field, we don't know what's around the corner and we don't know what we're doing half the time, okay? But you just gotta go for it, okay? You gotta work hard and just go for it. I know that's probably not what you wanna hear, but go find something that's gonna be fun so that you don't mind working hard and working on it. And then try not to kill yourself in some electronics accident or something like that. But. <laughs> Hopefully that's not going to happen. Yeah. You, you mentioned several of your advisors along the way in the presentation. How important now in retrospect do you think <coughs> relationships that you've had like that, those professional relationships, how important have they been to your success? Uh, so m my advisor, he was mostly a Carnegie Mellon, okay, but he was really instrumental uh, in helping me because he believed I should get my PhD done quickly, so he, he, he was okay with pushing me along. Uh, and so that was really important. And I mentioned this guy, Gil, who was a Cornell professor, and uh, he wrote me a really great letter for my postdoc, okay? And uh, it wasn't because, uh, you know, like I said, he seemed kind of grouchy, but uh, there are people out there who, I don't care if they're grouchy, they probably give you good advice and they really help you along. And he really helped me along because there were some other Cornell professors who were not good, okay, who were, who were not good. So, um, I, there were, and then um, my postdoctoral advisor, uh, that was really important. Uh, this guy, uh, uh, Guggenheim fellow. Uh, anyway, um, because our experiment, the Z691, was so fantastic, he, he won all of these things, National Academy of Sciences and all that. And uh, he ended up being the director of Fermilab for several years. Now he's the director of Berkeley. Uh, it, it helped to have somebody like that be my postdoctoral advisor. <laughs> And he was fun, by the way. He was a nice guy. Yeah. What, what would you classify as uh, or the more creative aspects of your research? What would, what would fall into that? <clears throat> Well, I, part of that thing is I get bored doing the same thing all the time. So one of the fun things for me is I get to do all kinds of different things, okay? I could be working with an oscilloscope and, and, and then I get tired of doing that. And then I start learning about machine learning. And, and so to me, what is really creative is that I get to switch and do all of these things and I don't have to do the same thing until I'm bored. 
Okay, so the creative thing, to me, um, I, you know, I'm not into the theory, okay? Um, theorists are creative, I'll say that for them. And one of the things, uh, when I was a postdoc at Santa Barbara, my, uh, uh, my, my uh, advisor said, uh, we want you to go talk to the grad students, the first year grad students, and tell them about being experimentalists, so recruit them into a, our field. And at that time, I used to hang out with all the theorists, and all the theorists are normally on the top floors of the building, okay? And um, so they were all, a whole bunch of postdocs, uh, you know. Uh, we saw, what's his name, Hawking. He came because he was collaborating with people. So all of these theorists, they're all very interesting. And I said, oh, wow, you guys have this nice view. You get to look out at the ocean all the time. And they said, I said, so what are you doing? And are you staring, are you whale watching? And they said, no, most of the theorists just spend all their time staring out the window thinking, about sex. And I was like, okay. I can spend a little time staring out the window thinking about sex, but a particle physicist, an experimentalist, actually can't spend all their time staring out the window thinking about sex. So we're having a lot more fun because we're doing a lot more things than staring out the window thinking about sex. <laughs> All right, well, please join me in thanking Alex and congratulations.